So um, I'm just going to spend about five minutes today to um, talk to you about TMS and memory disorders. And really the goal here is to inform um, the clinical neurologist side and the residents on the current and future potential um, for TMS at Duke um, for memory disorders. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with it, TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, the end point device here um, is essentially a couple of coils with uh, wrapped copper wire. We pass an electric current through that wire, um, which in turn generates a magnetic field. You can see here in dotted lines um, around the coil. When you put that near the head, um, you induce a current um, back to an electrical current um, in the brain. Um, and that allows us to initiate action potentials um, at various sites in the brain. Um, we have lots of capability here at Duke for this. So this is a, a room in the Brain uh, Stimulation Research Center um, up in fifth floor red zone. Um, you can see a number of cool pieces. There's a TMS stimulator over here on the left, a robotic arm, which actually controls uh, the location of stimulation with millimeter precision. Um, the patient here in the middle, there's a brain site navigation to make sure that we're um, actually stimulating in the right place. Um, so I just want to tell you um, a little bit about background and then a few studies that we're doing. So the current state is actually pretty promising. So this is a recent meta-analysis um, of about uh, 15 studies, which used many different uh, cortical targets, tends to be dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but um, there's a range, um, and many different outcome measures, um, uh, MOCA, verbal fluency, picture naming, and back past. So the field is sort of a little wild west right now, but it certainly um, seems to be like there's a, an effect here, um, even when you account for publication bias. Um, the problem is, is that TMS in these clinical settings often proceeds because of efficacy and not necessarily because of understanding. We don't know why it works, we just know that it works. Um, and so right now the big gaps in the AD literature for TMS are, you know, what are the mechanisms we're actually affecting with this? What are the targets um, that we're actually uh, seeking to, to uh, activate? And how do we individualize this for individual people? So um, three of the studies that might help with that, so they're being conducted here at Duke. Um, the mechanism, one of the mechanisms that I'm proposing is um, this sort of bilateral mechanism. So um, I call this kind of the dumbbell theory of aging. You can lift a dumbbell with one arm when you're young and you need two arms when you're older. Um, the idea that we essentially activate bilateral cortices, um, mostly in PFC, although you see this effect also in parietal cor cortex. Um, as we age, we tend to activate more bilateral regions. Um, so we decided we're actually going to uh, try and control this process. And so what we do is we set up um, uh, both healthy controls and MCIs up with an EEG cap um, and uh, set up two concurrent uh, TMS coils, which elicit uh, uh, stimulation at different frequencies and different intensities. Um, uh, results for this look good. We do increase this bilateral uh, communication. All this red stuff up here in the PFC uh, means that we're able to increase the bilateral um, communication, both structurally and functionally um, relative to sham. Um, and we also getting episodic memory improvements um, with a specific frequency um, uh, stimulation in the beta frequency. And this is where the sort of specialized memory score um, based on task we use. So that's one study that's completed, a second study that's um, recruiting now. Um, so what I'm showing you here is actually the typical TMS treatment for depression or a representation of it. So essentially you do a behavioral assessment at the beginning, um, a behavioral assessment at the end, and in between you have about 20 sessions of uh, TMS, each on a different day, each for about 40 minutes um, a day. You come into clinic and have that done. Um, the targeting for this, how you get set up for it, um, in some of the best cases, it's scalp features. Um, sometimes it's not even that. So um, essentially setting up an EEG tape, uh, you can see over here on the right, and finding the F3 location on EEG cap um, roughly corresponds to DLPFC um, across people. So I hope it's sort of obvious that there's some problems with the target. It's um, not clear. Um, what the actual brain target is, um, or if we're actually stimulating cortex. It's also kind of it's, it's unclear like what the reasoning is for the time course of this and when we actually expect to see changes. So what we want to do is kind of scale that down. So we have um, a, a so-called net TMS for memory disorders um, for which we're recruiting MCIs in. And so we actually just do three days of TMS, but we follow those individuals very comprehensively with both behavioral assessments, 
um, concurrent MRI. So this is done actually within the MRI scanner. Um, and we actually collect serum at multiple time points after this, because we really want to drill down on what are the specific short-term changes in structural connectivity, as well as some of these other measures um, after three days of tinnitus. We might actually figure out what we're doing. In the tinnitus. And then the last study I'll tell you about is just the um, uh, study we have um, planned, which is actually going to individualize in real time. So we're going to use um, uh, closed loop TMS with concurrent TMS and EEG. You, you start with some sort of EEG signal, um, which you're going to isolate to use to uh, analyze in real time, which is then going to trigger a stimulation device and elicit some target brain state. So you have some, some kind of brain activity that you want. Um, I've outlined a couple already. Um, and so how we do this, we first identify what a target is. So, you know, we talk all the time in, uh, about dose response relationships, but TMS actually doesn't have very strong dose response relationships mapped out. We have it very strong for the motor system. Um, but outside of that, we don't know what the effect on the brain is for varying um, parameters of TMS, specifically TMS intensity. And so what we do is we stick people in the scanner and do a concurrent TMS fMRI to elicit this dose response curve um, in individuals. So we find out the optimum uh, intensity for a given level of bold. Um, then we bring people in for a second day um, uh, where we come in for closed loop TMS, where we trigger uh, based on some of those same EEG features we mentioned before. And over the course of an individual session, we actually expect um, performance to increase um, relative to the start. We expect this effect to be a little bit stronger and healthy controls of NCI, but still um, a, a benefit nonetheless. So all that's just basically a, a big uh, advertisement for, we have a brain simulation research center um, up in the fifth floor red zone. Um, please talk to me if you have any interest in this kind of in research um, and I'll leave it at that. Beautifully done, Simon. All right, let me get back to Zoom. Share screen. Okay. Okay, before we introduce the grand round speaker, I just want everyone to know that a couple of people are hogging the Duke Neurology All-Star nominations, uh, but please send them into Will Alexander. Uh, uh, don't send them to me, but send them to Will and, and Will, they get a little uh, certificate, a little notice on the website and mention it grand rounds. Am I right, Will? I don't know. If That's correct. Right. We also got a um, coffee mugs. Awesome. All right. So please feel free. Don't let me and Wayne and uh, Will hog it all. Uh, just to kind of get over the COVID fatigue, I want you to know that today many different entities are celebrating National XX Day. And I just wanted to mention that today is National Cheese Toast Day, something I think I probably put together at some point in my life, not knowing it was a thing, but just out of desperation. National Felt Hat Day, and my favorite, thank God, National Double Cheeseburger Day. So a little something to help you think there's something beyond COVID. Uh, so it is my true honor to, to introduce my friend, Mike Lutz, who's going to do grand rounds today. I'm almost embarrassed to say Michael is, is an associate professor of neurology because he's so integral to the academic mission of the department. Uh, he got his PhD in biomedical engineering, not in biostats, he's self-taught in that field. And anyone who knows Mike knows that he is just an incredible smart person and an avid learner. He worked at Glaxo for 21 years as, and rose to be director of computational biology at Glaxo. In our department, he directs, uh, in addition to his own research program, the statistical assistance program that, that helps other people with grants and is one of the reasons why uh, the grant funding in our department has been so strong. He's also the data core director of the newly funded Duke UNC ADRC, and he's the associate editor of Alzheimer's and Dementia, which is the, the journal of record in the field of dementing disorders. Mike's the author of multiple uh, papers on a variety of subjects, including genetics of Alzheimer's disease. We're truly fortunate he's with us at, at Duke. Uh, 
And today, Mike is going to talk about drug repurposing for Alzheimer's disease. So, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Rich. Um, thank you very much for that, that uh, kind introduction. Uh, can you see the screen? Yep. Okay. So I considered several topics for today's presentation that were related to Alzheimer's genetics. And I settled on this topic after reading some papers that stirred my curiosity about the current state of the work and was excited about how some of these projects that I'm working on uh, here at Duke in, in neurology could provide data to drug repurposing strategies. I'd also done some work on repurposing during my time at uh, GSK. So I was sort of interested in how the field had changed. And uh, this gave me a nice opportunity to do that. Um, so today's presentation is a combination of a review article, journal club, data club, and a research project proposal. I'll present some work from several groups that are on drug repurposing for Alzheimer's disease and show data from projects underway in the department here that can fit into drug discovery and drug repurposing strategies. The three specific ones that I pulled out from a set of a, a couple of really good candidates were genetic pleiotropy, single cell RNA-seq, which actually ties with that, and then mouse models that are more relevant to human late onset Alzheimer's disease. This infographic from the Alzheimer's Association shows the devastating impact of Alzheimer's disease in the US and in the world. Six million Americans are living with the disease at a cost to the nation in 2021 of 355 billion. Neurologists are on the front line with respect to providing clinical guidance and care to these patients uh, and their families. So you see firsthand the terrible toll that this disease takes on the individual's quality of life and the challenges of caring for these patients. Unfortunately, there's not much in the toolbox that's available for treatment. And over the last 20 years, there's been a long series of failed drugs that did not show efficacy in clinical trials. The success rate for drug discovery in Alzheimer's has been dismal, even considering the overall rate of attrition in drug discovery. NIH estimates that about 80 to 90% of drugs fail before human trials even start, and about 50% fail in phase three. However, the attrition rate for Alzheimer's clinical trials up to about uh, mid uh, 20, uh, 2010, 2012 is estimated at 99.6%. The lower part of this slide shows the mechanisms associated with the different drugs that have been through clinical trials. The amyloid cascade has been a favorite class for a long time. Telepathy, a more recent entry in the race, and neuroinflammation gaining some ground. This data is all pre-approval of aducanumab, so we can add one more approved block in 2021. We'll move on now to thinking about the disease itself, the neuropathology, biomarker changes, biological basis, and genetics. There have been a number of models of the temporal relationships of biomarkers of the uh, neuropathology uh, and associated pathophysiology in Alzheimer's disease, many developed by Clifford Jack at the Mayo. This slide is a classic version showing that the earliest change is decreasing amyloid beta 42 in the cerebral spinal fluid, followed by fibrillar uh, amyloid beta deposition in the brain, increased tau in the CSF, hippocampal atrophy and hypometabolism, and finally the cognitive and clinical changes is measured by the clinical dementia rating sum of boxes occurring at the last. This y-axis on this plot is actually interesting. It's the difference in a normalized score for each of these markers or measures uh, between a mutation carrier, ATP or presenilin. So these are people who uh, almost always develop Alzheimer's disease and develop it at a fairly early age and non-carriers. The important point to make about this slide, aside from the temporal relationships, uh, kind of the separation between the different curves in terms of years of expected onset, is first how early this, the uh, changes start, 30 to 20 years before the symptom onset. The second part is the uh, interpretation of this data has driven many Alzheimer's disease drug discovery projects with a focus on reducing amyloid deposition. The drugs that uh, include classes of gamma secretase inhibitors and beta secretase inhibitors. There are drug repurposing and drug discovery efforts around beta amyloid the tau. However, I'm going to take a broader mechanistic view of the disease. Today, I'd encourage you to focus on factors that combine together over a lifetime to contribute to the disease. To address the global impact of Alzheimer's disease, we need to think about not only the patients with the disease, but the patients that will develop the disease decades later. 
with an emphasis on prevention or delay of onset. As is the case for most genetically complex diseases, genetic factors, environmental factors, and their interactions impact the development and progression of Alzheimer's disease. Some of the factors change over the lifespan. These include epigenetics and comorbidities, and some are considered the pillars of aging, common drivers of, common, of, uh, of uh, chronic diseases. These include inflammation, metabolic changes, and cellular stress. All seven of the pillars of aging have some association in the role in the development of Alzheimer's disease. And this slide is from the Duke UNC Alzheimer's Disease Research Center P30 grant that as uh, Rich mentioned was just funded. Uh, the aims of the center and the composition of the clinical cohort uh, for the center are designed to investigate age-related changes across the lifespan that mediate the development, progression, and experience of Alzheimer's disease. As part of the clinical core research strategy for the center proposal, Dr. O'Brien put together this table of research studies on factors that kick in as early as when people are in their 20s and 30s that decades later contribute to the development of Alzheimer's disease. Amyloid deposition, for example, can start 30 years before the symptoms develop. Each row in this table reports specific observations, some of which are opportunities for drug target identification and possibly drug repurposing. Up until this year, only a few drugs were approved for Alzheimer's disease, or probably a more correctly mild to severe dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. These uh, drugs at best treated symptoms and are primarily uh, cholinesterase inhibitors. This year saw the approval of aducanumab. This was a very controversial approval based primarily on data that showed that the drug lowered beta amyloid. That said, this is not the first drug that lowered beta amyloid and the clinical functional data on cognition was challenging to interpret for these trials, and it wasn't consistent between the two trials. Um, thinking about this table a little bit, I think uh, you would also need to add or consider adding recommendations on exercise, diet, and maintaining good cardio cardiovascular health for younger people. Every year, Jeff Cummings at UCLA publishes a paper in the journal Alzheimer's and Dementia on the Alzheimer's disease drug development pipeline. And this slide shows the snapshot for 2021. There are 126 agents in 152 trials assessing new therapies for Alzheimer's disease, 28 treatments in phase three trials, 74 in phase two, 24 in phase one. The majority of the drugs in these trials, about a little over 82%, target the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease with the intent of disease modification. Just over 10% are putative cognitive enhancing agents, 7% are drugs that are being developed to reduce neuropsychiatric symptoms. And you can work your way around the circle by the mechanism of action and phase of the clinical trial. This slide shows the mechanism of action for Alzheimer's drugs in clinical trials um, based on data from the previous slide. The mechanism of action landscape is becoming a more balanced portfolio. Amyloid has the largest number of trials at five, 19 are in the category of inflammation, infection and immunity. So we'll get back to some of these points a little, bit, a little bit later, but this brings us to finding new therapies with the main approaches of drug discovery or drug repurposing. This Chevron diagram is a classic. I was surprised that not much had changed on it since the 1990s when I was working at GSK, despite new technologies introduced in many fields. Some are shown in the gray blocks uh, around systems-based um, drug discovery. Timing-wise, it takes about 10 to 12 years to travel from the discovery phase to marketplace, with six to seven years in the, for clinical trials alone. The diagram covers the steps, but you should always question linear flow diagrams. The reality of drug discovery is that the process may more resemble a plate of spaghetti, with feedback loops, dead ends, and sometimes just back to the drawing board. The idea be behind drug repurposing, where you start with a drug that's currently on the market, is that the time frame for this process can be greatly reduced since a drug has already gone through clinical trials and data is available on safety, adverse surveillance, and perhaps even dosage, although efficacy for a new indication and a relevant dose would have to be considered. With this slide, I tried to balance potential expectations around repurposed drugs with the reality and experience. Literature is full of examples of studies of repurposing drugs in different models. Bioinformatics literature has numerous approaches and software outlined. However, the overall success rate of bringing a repurposed drug uh, to full approval is very rare. Still, for pharma, it's a great value proposition in terms of sales, as you can see, um, 
the repositioned drugs generated over 250 billion in sales worldwide, five of them generating over 1 billion in their new indication. The uh, idea that I raised today though, sort of the, the part on setting expectations is that Alzheimer's disease is a good candidate for repurposing strategies. And the, available, the availability of recent preclinical and clinical data, some of which I'll present today, may increase the odds for uh, success. There's some great examples recently of drug repurposing in our department. Actually, at least three were mentioned recently in recent neurology grand rounds. These ideas cover ALS, Alzheimer's disease, and dystonia. And there's some references here, uh, papers uh, and, um, and websites on uh, some of the work going on. Uh, in these different areas for drug repurposing. But when you consider that the biochemical targets of drugs, including receptors, enzymes, ion channels, transporters, are ubiquitous in different organs and cellular systems, it's not surprising that they may have an impact on the disease aside from their original indication. Um, last point, COVID did in, uh, initiate considerable discussion about drug repurposing, really for better or for worse, for researchers, clinicians, and, and uh, the general public. This slide shows some of the examples of repurposed drugs from approaches that were used in the past. These are examples that start with either the drug itself, the target, the biochemical pathway, the disease, or an unex uh, unexpected side effect. And Viagra is sort of the classic example there. Using this one at a time strategy, one target, one pathway, one disease has led to several successful repurposing efforts, uh, notably in oncology. This slide shows some of the repurposed drugs currently in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. You note the number of entries for both metabolic diseases and cardiovascular disorders. I think this may be an important clue. In the past, there have been efforts to repurpose drugs uh, used to treat these diseases for Alzheimer's disease. And this chart is one part of a larger list from the paper cited in the uh, lower right-hand corner of the slide. Um, I chose these specifically to show and emphasize enrichment for metabolic and cardiovascular diseases. And there are two drugs that I wanted to highlight. Uh, and yes, uh, even Viagra made the list, which could make it one of the most repurposed drugs ever up there with aspirin. Several of us at Duke were involved in the Tomorrow clinical trial of pioglitazone. This trial was designed to test the efficacy and safety of low-dose pioglitazone to delay the onset of mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease uh, in at-risk participants. Study was terminated in January 2018 after failing to meet the non-futility threshold, and some details are provided in the table. The dose was 0.8 milligrams of pioglitazone daily, in contrast to a starting dose of 15 or 30 milligrams daily to treat type 2 diabetes. So in this case, the trial centered or, or really was focused on a very low dose. Second uh, drug that I highlighted is an ACE inhibitor, perindopril, which is currently in a phase two clinical trial with an estimated completion date of early, uh, early next year. But uh, again, if you go to this reference, you actually have the clinical trial numbers and you can see what the, uh, what the status is for each of, these, uh, each of these trials. Now we're gonna sort of move, move forward. Um, this slide presents a more updated recent approach to strategy for drug repurposing for Alzheimer's that builds on the underlying neuropathologies, biology, and associated genetics. And this slide is one of a series in, uh, that I'm using in this talk that uh, came from several research papers out of the Lerner Research Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. And this had really stirred my interest in, uh, in, in uh, drug repurposing. So the slide you see, these endophenotype networks sort of in the middle of the slide, these networks are derived from genomes or more precisely genetic or genomic data for the endophenotype. You could think about for example, genome-wide association studies for both CSF amyloid and tau. Deriving the networks is a mathematical step to draw a map of the interactions and groupings in the data. There are various approaches to make these maps. They can be based on co-expression, enrichment of specific sets of genes, construction of models. <clears throat> the drug target interactome is also derived from public databases like drug bank. These networks can be combined again, using graph theory to show where a specific target, in this case, the little pink squares, interact with components of the different subnetworks. And here, the example was amyloid uh, and tau. Now, graph theory and networks is a math stat course in itself, probably actually several. For today, though, I'd ask that you focus on the properties of the network rather than they, how they are computed. The right-hand uh, right side of the slide 
shows a further expansion of this strategy based on different types of endophenotypes that may be extremely relevant to drug repositioning, especially for Alzheimer's dementia. Getting back to some of the points that uh, I was making earlier about the, early, the earliest um, uh, development of pathology in, in Alzheimer's disease. Yet they fit into this overall framework uh, presented in this paper of, uh, of, using, these, of using these networks. Um, these data come from three projects that I'm collaborating on within the neurology department, the shared genetic etiology between diseases, immune specific genetics and interactions, uh, metabolic and lipidomic changes uh, that happen over the lifespan. Um, these projects take this strategy further than just looking at the interactions between amyloid and tau and expand to cover this, this uh, much wider spectrum of the human uh, lifespan and also different, different biomarkers. I'll present results from some of these projects with the aim of showing how they complement and extend these networks on the other side of the slide. Taking the two parts of the slide together forms the research project proposal of, the, of this talk on sort of how these different types of data have the potential to develop a new strategy for drug repurposing for Alzheimer's disease. So staying with the left-hand side of the previous slide, this picture shows uh, multiple cell cellular and physiologic targets, including the vasculature and the mitochondria. It's possible to target one or more of these endophenotype me or mechanisms, perhaps with a compound at a different dose from the original indication, perhaps as a combination, perhaps at a specific time, uh, relative to the development of the pathology. This schematic shows how the results from the different, uh, overlaying the different networks can be put into context with experiments to test and validate drug repurposing candidates. The top part of the slide or panel A we've already covered. Panel D shows testing in iPSC or stem cell models and validation using electronic medical records. The two parts that have the potential to make drug repurposing for Alzheimer's disease potentially more effective are first on the front end, a clearer idea of the targets through in integration of the different types of data, um, notably the omic data. Second, testing of the hypothesis of a drug effect before you do a clinical trial uh, using electronic healthcare records. Now this second part's a double-edged sword. Um, these, there are massive databases that provide high statistical power, but if the diagnoses and other data in the records are variable, inconsistent, or measured differently, um, you can think about diagnosing MCI, for example, then the results of the analysis may not be all that strong. To give you some idea of the numbers, though, for these databases, um, the Truven Market Scan database, uh, that's a database of 200 million enrollees, the Optum Clinformatics database, 60 million. Um, one thing that the, uh, these investigators did that I thought was uh, particularly um, promising was uh, when they did this electronic healthcare record, they did propensity score matching to adjust uh, for, for some of the confounders. And when you're comparing individuals on a compound to individuals not, this is really a, a key point to doing a robust statistical analysis. We'll get a little bit of detail of that later. After all of the computational work is done, this slide illustrates the results of the analysis from uh, the Cleveland Clinic group. Uh, in panel A, far left, you see 25 repurposable drug candidates for Alzheimer's disease. These drugs made the cut by having some published evidence for Alzheimer's disease, which is a fairly low bar. On the right are Alzheimer's disease risk genes. The middle part is the network overlay. So this is the connection between the drug target network and the target AD risk gene or endophenotype network. Panel B shows this mapping for one drug, pioglitazone, and it's perhaps the clearest picture of how all of this works. There's six drug targets or physical binding proteins for pio in the green box uh, these are shown, they include the three PPR subtypes, gamma, delta, and alpha. These six proteins have interactions with 12 Alzheimer's disease risk genes, or more precisely, the proteins encoded by these genes, since the interaction is derived from a protein-protein interaction. PPR gamma is the most promiscuous, interacting with seven Alzheimer's target genes. PPR alpha interacts with three targets, delta with two. And panel C um, lists the strength the, 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 the different drugs indicating the strength of evidence in different classes or types of experiments, in vitro, in vivo, or clinical. Now, as clinicians, you may look at this list of drugs and say, no way on some of them, hmm, maybe on others. And that insight is vitally important to drug repurposing strategies that depend on computational modeling of any type. So I'm actually very easy to, to come up with computational proposals or hypotheses around drug repurposing. The question is, which of them will actually 
uh, uh, benefit the patient. It was intriguing to me that the learner group uh, analysis pulled out pyoglitazone as the top candidate. Um, here are some of the results of computationally testing pyoglitazone using half a million medical records from the market scan Medicare database. This statistical analysis is complex uh, and it's based on that propensity score matching that I um, had mentioned where they match individuals who received PIO with those who were not at a ratio of one to four by carefully adjusting the initiation time of the PIO, the enrollment history, the age, the gender, and the disease com comorbidities. Um, with, with Again, with the, the millions of people in the database, you're actually able to do this because you can pull out individuals uh, that will, will match up. It's also promising it saying to me that they took out the study for six years of follow-up. And you can see there's good separation of the Kaplan-Meier curves and a p-value that's arguably statistically significant, as is the hazard ratio of 0.9. That said, the effect size is very small. Look at the y-axis relative to the separation of the curves. You're not seeing a huge change in the proportion of, uh, of individuals um, uh, who, who, who do not uh, develop AD. And um, the uh, hazard ratio, while statistically significant, it's uh, indicative of, of, a, of a fairly small effect size. These are the results or the final results from the Tomorrow study. So again, Kaplan-Meier curves compare, is comparing that 0.8 milligram uh, PIO group with the placebo. Statistical analysis for this is much easier actually than the last slide since it's a randomized clinical trial. That gives you actually all of the statistical assumptions. Uh, uh, you don't have to, to uh, it, it's, it's actually a very straightforward analysis. Um, similar to the previous slide though, the effect size is small. Again, the differences on the, the Y axis are small. Uh, and the hazard ratio is not statistically significant. It's at uh, 0.8, but it, uh, it crosses one. So, you know, no significance there. Um, so in, in some ways it's very similar to the previous analysis, which to me was intriguing. Um, this study was terminated at three and a half years. So it's unclear whether the separation uh, between the groups would have held as more individuals converted. But it was intriguing to me that despite the origin of the data from these two plots being so different, from entirely different settings, there's evidence for a small, uh, a small effect size uh, to reduce risk. So now I'm gonna switch gears and cover some of the work underway in Duke Neurology that has the potential to open up new approaches for Alzheimer's disease drug discovery and uh, drug repurposing. Uh, this slide captures the overall strategy for several projects that are underway in the Duke Division of Translational Brain Sciences. Note that this strategy is not linear. In fact, it's really key that you have feedback between the, the steps of the approach that drive um, the process, especially between the computational genetics parts and the work in the laboratory. So on the genotype phenotype association side, you have genome-wide association studies, different types of sequencing, polygenic risk scores area. I wish I could, had time to cover today, but do not. Uh, genetic pleiotropy, and then looking at mechanisms. So this is primarily um, laboratory work here, functional studies, uh, CRISPR, single cell RNA-seq, um, and then some computational pieces here too, including Mendelian randomization. So a quick review of Alzheimer's genetics. This type of plot shows two important aspects of the genetic variable like a SNP. Uh, on the x-axis is the frequency of the variant in a population. The y-axis shows the effect size, typically the odds ratio. Most genome-wide association results are in the lower right corner minor allele frequencies of about 0.05 or greater, and low effect sizes, 1.1 to 1.5. Alzheimer's disease is unique among diseases of aging by having both rare large effect size genetic mutations and a large effect size common variant, which is APHOV4. The three uh, rare mutations, the amyloid precursor protein and the two presenilins, cause early onset Alzheimer's disease, only about 5% of the total cases. Um, APOE has a rather large effect size. If you could look at an odds ratio of say 34 for APOE4 homozygous, three for heterozygous, to a, uh, compare that to an effect size of 1.4 to 1.8 for the association of the TCL2, TCL, sorry, TCF7L2 gene uh, association with type two diabetes, which is a second example uh, given a, a, as a, a moderate effect size common genetic variant. This genome-wide association study of GWAS from 2018 is the data set used for many subsequent studies, including a few that I've published about. The GWAS represents the work of large consortia 
uh, including the International Genomics of Alzheimer's Disease Project. The study has a large sample size, over 35,000 cases and 60,000 controls, which allows testing for very small effect sizes. The results confirm 20 previously identified genetic loci associated with Alzheimer's disease and have identified five new loci. These plots, if you're not familiar with them, they're, they're often called Manhattan plots for a resemblance to the New York City skyline, summarize the association statistics. The x-axis is the locus in the genome. You have blocks for each chromosome and then a simple linear progression by base pair. The y-axis is the negative log, p, negative log of the p-value for the association of a SNP with case status in this study, Alzheimer's disease. Horizontal lines are drawn at levels indicating genome-wide significance, which corrects for the large number of SNPs tested, typically in the millions. So here on this plot, you see a very strong signal for APOE on chromosome 19, and relatively strong signals for other genes, which you may have seen discussed in Alzheimer's disease genetics papers. So what a difference a year makes. Um, in this case, in this study, um, statistical power of 80,000 cases and 400,000 controls makes it possible to pull out more low effect size SNPs, even with the multiple, multiple comparison penalty that you have to pay with the GWAS. In this preprint, uh, they reported 75 low size associated with Alzheimer's disease. In this case, they used proxies to define Alzheimer's disease cases, which allowed the use of even larger cohorts. So we and others have designed studies that use the GWAS data from the large consortia studies in combination with other data. Duke Neurology and Duke Psychiatry authors have published several studies of genetic pleiotropy, late onset Alzheimer's disease with PTSD and major depressive disorder. With colleagues at Wake Forest, we've looked at genetic pleiotropy between cognitive impairment and systemic inflammation in plasma lipids in large longitudinal community studies like the Health and Retirement Survey. In fact, we recently replicated um, the results in the Health and Retirement Study in the Women's Health Initiative uh, memory study. We presented those results at AAIC this year and uh, are, are finalizing a manuscript on that replication study. But there's a very important point to make about these studies, though, that goes beyond genetic pleiotropy between diseases. Because the age of onset of these diseases can be so different, PTSD is a great example, these studies have the potential to bridge the genetics of these diseases across the age spectrum. PTSD often occurs uh, much earlier than Alzheimer's disease. So in the case of PTSD and major depressive disorder and in these community studies, we can ask the question whether genetically um, does this, um, this phenotype, endophenotype disease share etiology with late onset, late, late onset Alzheimer's disease developed much later in life. I don't have time to describe the statistical model for testing genetic pleiotropy, and a few new ones have also come on the, the scene. Um, but the principle is that we calculate a conditional probability correcting for false discovery rates. So we have, for example, the probability of an association of a SNP with late onset Alzheimer's disease conditional on an association between the SNP and PTSD or major depressive or uh, a uh, inflammation phenotype, for example. The derivation that I did here shows how these probabilities can be calculated based on cumulative distribution functions from the original GWAS study data. This plot examines the conditional probability for late onset Alzheimer's disease conditional with major depressive disorder. Plot similar to the Manhattan plot that I showed earlier, but this is a conditional probability corrected for false discovery rates. The panel on the left includes the SNPs around the APOE code, the coding region, uh, and the panel on the right excludes them. You can see the strong APOE signal. However, you also see a strong signal on chromosome 11. The key point here and, and sort of the punchline for this is that signal in effect gets amplified when you combine the Alzheimer's disease data with the major depressive disorder data. The signal clearly uh, exceeds genome-wide significance. Very similar results observed for the conditional probabilities for late onset Alzheimer's disease and PTSD. Again, this amplification of a signal on chromosome 11. For the PTSD work, the signal on chromosome 11 that I showed in the conditional Manhattan plot was also replicated in an independent PTSD data set. Last two columns show the false discovery rate adjusted p-values for both discovery and the replication cohorts. Six genes which were FDR significant in both discovery and replication cohorts share common biological function in processes that are involved in inflammation and immunity. MS4 family genes uh, that we pulled out here are involved as chemosensory receptors. 
These genes are expressed in microglia and regulate cell activation. Interestingly, a recent study reported genome-wide significant association for Alzheimer's risk within a 1KB window uh, at two of these genes, MS4A6A and MS4A4A, for CPG-related SNPs and identified a strong negative dosage effect of these SNPs on AD uh, risk. Um, so this window, these, these SNPs were also found to be associated with increased DNA methylation in both brain and blood. Taken together, these res results support future studies to explore the specific nature of epigenetic relation, regulation of immune-related genes, such as the MSA4 family, in the context of both load or late onset Alzheimer's disease and PTSD. Very similar results for the uh, analysis of genetic play pleiotropy between late onset Alzheimer's disease and major depressive disorder. MS4 family identified as being some of the most significant conditional association results along with the SPI1 gene. This slide presents the results uh, of expression quantitative lo trait loci or EQTL analyses for the most significant genetic loci and specific SNP snake signals that were pulled out for this conditional association of late onset Alzheimer's disease uh, and major depressive disorder result. The specific SNPs are listed at the far left column and the EQTL P values in whole blood and monocytes are given in the table. The monocyte signals are of a particular interest as a consequence of their role in the immune system. While there are limitations of selecting genes as associated with a trait based on proximity to a SNP, it is a starting point. It's important to, to not to conclude that these genes are causal for Alzheimer's disease, major depressive disorder, or PTSD. Further biological experiments are needed to demonstrate causality. Um, could be, for example, gene editing. Indeed, some of the Alzheimer's disease risk genes that were identified by proximity in the early GWAS were later shown not to be the causal genes. However, taking these caveats in mind, this slide shows some of the biological functions and associated diseases for the genes identified in the genetic pleiotropy studies. And uh, I guess you can see some drug repurposing potential here. Um, one way to get us closer to causality is to examine gene expression in specific types of cells, such as microglia. In the past, transcriptomic analysis uh, was done on bulk tissue samples, millions of cells. Single nuclei, nuclei uh, RNA sequencing changed this protocol by allowing isolation of single nuclei from neurons, astrocytes, microglia, and endothelial cells. The isolation of the single nuclei, nuclei is accomplished by techniques including fluorescence-activated nuclei sorting, microfluidics, and droplet-based methods. These plots present data that show the separation into clusters of the RNA-seq data uh, for an experiment that was looking at um, different uh, single-cell data in um, uh, individuals with late-onset Alzheimer's disease or controls. The plots present the data uh, on what they call the UMAP plot, which is uniform manifold approximation projection. Um, it's a way of reducing dimensionality, which is very common in, in omic data. You can think of it um, roughly like a principal component analysis that takes the dimension of your data from a huge number of genes down to something that you can visualize clusters. Panel A shows the um, clustering of the data by cell type. So you can see the microglia, astrocytes, neurons, endothelial cells. Panel B and C show the difference between samples in the microglia cluster, cluster from patients with late onset Alzheimer's disease and matched controls. The glial cluster is different from the, for the MS4A6A expression as shown by the much large, the darker color in the load cluster. So I've highlighted that with the, uh, the circles. And the statistics at the bottom of the slide show a highly uh, significant difference in log fold change of 0.62 between these clusters for the MS4A6A expression. And this work is from Dr. Chiba Pollock's lab. Taking the single nuclei RNA-seq work a step further, this chart shows parallel uh, single nuclei RNA-seq and single nuclei, nuclei ATAC-seq from the same samples, again, focusing on a comparison of late onset Alzheimer's disease with matched cognitively normal controls. In rough terms, the RNA-seq measures uh, are, are looking at expression, while the ATAC-seq shows chromatin accessibility. Both help to determine the regulatory profile of the different genes in the assay. Panel A shows the overall differences and similarities for late onset disease, samples and controls, 
panel B shows the fold change for a number of genes uh, within the MS4, uh, with the MS4 family genes highlighted. These volcano plots show the statistical significance of the fold change on the y-axis, which is on a log scale, and the um, uh, p-value uh, on, on the, uh, the p-value on the y-axis, log fold change on the x. Specific log fold changes for MS4, uh, A6A and MS4, A6E uh, are shown in panel C for both plots. Other groups are folding single cell results into drug repurposing studies. Uh, these plots contrast microglial clusters with disease associated microglia, which are the green points, and homeostasis associated microglia, which are the blue points. And you can see good separation of the clusters in panel A. Panel B pulls out some of the marker genes for the disease associated microglial cluster. This is a summary slide that compiles data on a list of drugs from the single cell data uh, in, this, in this paper that has the potential to be repurposed for Alzheimer's disease. The high confidence drugs with the strongest evidence are underlined. And in the paper, they ran an analysis similar to the one that I showed for, for pioglitazone, for fluticasone and for mimetazone. The way you read the chart, which I say it takes a little getting used to reading these charts, um, is that the columns are the different studies in disease associated microglia, or disease-associated astrocytes. As you move from left to right on the columns, uh, your data is covering single nucleus, single cell, mouse, and human networks for microglia and astrocytes. Each cell in the table uh, assesses the strength of evidence for the drug against the uh, microglial or astrocytic study uh, with the green boxes indicating a false discovery p-value less than 0.05. The circles indicate the enrichment score from the network analysis that we were talking about earlier, ranging from zero, which is an open circle, to one, a closed circle. Therefore, the strongest evidence would be for drugs with one or more uh, green boxes and closed circles. Relevant in vivo models have the potential to enable drug repurposing. And I wanted to highlight uh, the work that Dr. Carol Colton and a group of investigators are do doing to develop mouse models that are more relevant to human late onset Alzheimer's disease to test some of the hypotheses that we're, uh, we're bringing up today. This slide presents the statistical analysis strategy for um, comparing these mouse and human models and the mouse and human and data. Um, human data derived from public databases is used to extract signatures that define subgroups of individuals using statistically based computational modeling. A similar process is followed for the mice, although this data is much more homogeneous. You can see the parallel paths for the human and mouse that progress from experimental data to multimodal features in terms of signatures and pathways. Finally, clustering and canonical correlation is done to contrast groups of individuals in mouse models. The specific human mouse uh, model comparisons that uh, we're interested in doing right now are focused on the effects of sex, APOE, and age on neuroimaging, behavioral, and biological phenotypes. And uh, Dr. Colton has presented uh, some of this work at Grand Rounds in, in the past. Um, we use this approach with two sets of data, one human and one mouse. Um, for human, we use proteomic data from ADNI. Uh, for mouse, proteomic data is obtained from um, some of Carol's uh, mouse models, CVN mouse, the NOS2 knockout mouse. The table shows the p-values for the association of specific pathways with the human and mouse classes for ADNI. This is uh, Alzheimer's disease compared with cognitively normal individuals. For mice, it's a comparison between the two models. The purple boxes show pathways that are significant after false discovery rate um, correction for both species. These are fairly general metabolic pathways that are listed in the top blocks and additional mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, pathways in the green boxes are of particular interest since these are significant only in the human. Interestingly, the middle green blocks show a group of related pathways, uh, including Incretin, GLP-1, and GIP. And we've got some work going on right now with a collaborator in uh, the Department of Statistics and, and, and a student uh, looking at these pathways in a little more detail. I don't have time to cover the theory and implementation of testing combinations of repurposed drugs, but thought it was important to mention, of it, to mention it. The combinatorics of testing compounds at different doses creates a challenge. However, combinations have the potential to be more effective than a single drug. Um, combinations could potentially allow you to use a lower concentration of one drug, uh, and then add a second one without overlapping in the pathways and targets that cause toxicity. Again, we have to think of beyond some of the simple network relations that I showed earlier. 
the fact that, for example, the drug um, is, uh, is, is, is hitting several uh, target genes may or may not be, be a good thing in, in all cases. It may be that you wanted to uh, actually have that, uh, that upregulation of, of several targets, but, but downregulate or leave neutral some of the others. Combinations lets you uh, deal with that type of problem. And I also wanted to give you a completely different approach to drug repurposing. Um, it doesn't at, at all involve all the omic data and all the computations that, uh, that, that I mentioned. Um, this is based on an expert consensus approach using the Delphi um, method. In this case, it's a consensus panel of 12 scientists. Each panel member gets to nominate 10 drugs. They do a full systemic review, systematic review of the literature uh, for five candidate compounds identified by at least three members of the panel. Then they go through a series of voting and ranking and discussion strategies that include face-to-face -face meetings uh, to prioritize the different potential drugs to repurpose. Um, they, some of it's done by email, some of it's done face-to-face. -face. Um, see evidently a lot of enthusiasm uh, about the Rho C kinase inhibitor, uh, Fosudil, and continued enthusiasm about acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and antivirals. So we've covered several examples and approaches for drug repurposing today. Some of the key points are listed on the slide. There is an open RFA right now from NIH on drug repurposing for Alzheimer's disease. So if this talk spurred some interest, I'd be glad to discuss. I also give the link to the uh, program called All's GPS from the Cleveland Clinic Group. Uh, it's a nice example of a compendium of different types of data to explore drugs, targets, and networks for Alzheimer's disease. And finally, I just want to uh, acknowledge and recognize uh, my many collaborators uh, uh, from uh, different parts of, of, of Duke, uh, Duke Neurology, Duke Psychiatry, uh, statistics and biostatistics and bioinformatics. And uh, thank you for your attention and glad to, uh, to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Um, I just wanted to mention that in my announcements, I had left one thing out and that uh, today at sundown starts the beginning of, of Yom Kippur. Uh, uh, which many of our colleagues will be celebrating every year. Um, I relook up the meaning so I, I don't get it wrong, but Yom Kippur marks the end of a 10 day period of reflection that begins on the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. It means the Day of Atonement, and the fasting focuses on repentance, but after uh, sundown tomorrow, it's ended with a feast that celebrates the upcoming new year with hope. And given what we've been through for the past two years, uh, our, our thoughts and prayers are with that as well. So if anyone has questions for Mike, please uh, send, send them an email. And uh, Mike is really good with email. And for everyone else, uh, uh, stay safe and have a great day. Thank you all.